All right, video working too. Thank you, everybody, and we're going to begin. And look what exciting video it is. It's a bounce. We expected this. <laughs> you know, these things are really hard. It's like, yeah, the Russell is going to bounce when it hits 2,000, and it does. It can go a little bit lower, just because it goes a little bit low doesn't mean anything. But it bounced at 2,000. It's bouncing around at 2,000, but this is not a very healthy looking bounce. It's more like a uh, consolidation for failure. But the other indexes are bouncing too. And um, so we're not so this, I mean, frankly, there's nothing to be worried about at this oh, incredible level anyway. It doesn't, the market should pull back a bit and consolidate. So there's nothing to worry about here. And of course, the dollar is up uh, about 0.4% today. So it was at 102.2 and now it's 102.57. So, um, so, you know, dollar up, market down, that's not a problem. Not, it's all just pretty normal stuff. And let's look at the FinViz chart, if that's working. Oh, um, seems to be. You chars, indexes. There we go. So, you know, as you can see, this is not even considered a pullback, really. <clears throat> I mean, we had such ridiculous run since November. So 16,000, you know, we're still at 16,600, 16,000 would be fine on that. It's like any of these levels, like here, anything he around here, 19,000 here on the Russell, uh, 46 on the S&P, it'll feel bad while it's going on, but these would be healthy pullbacks. And we really do have to test this 36,000 line on the Dow. It's a critical level. So we shall see what happened, happens, happened. <laughs> We shall have seen what will happen. Um, so what do they look like? They look like the DAX is uh, very strong up there. The NASDAQ's very strong, S&P strong. Nikkei's been hovering for a while. Russell was stupidly high, so this is only back to a normal thing where it could be. This would be, but this is like a triple top for the Russell. So if it fails it, it's probably gonna pull back a good amount, probably back to at least 19. Um, and it looks the same across the board. You know, we got to always remember though that this is for the S and P. This is a double top. You know, that's what that's what counts more than anything. This is a double top on the S and P. So the question is, how much of a pullback will we get this time? Last time we had a pretty significant pullback. So we shall see what happens. Oh. I know what I was going to do. I was going to Seeking Alpha. Read articles. Write an article. Profile. Oh, there we go. If I go to my profile, we'll find it. Do -de do 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 Analysis. This is the analysis I wrote? Yeah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, 10 market trends. That's the one I was looking for. I wrote that for Seeking Alpha back in November. And um, I'll leave that graphic. That's nice. Do, 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 do. All right. So let's talk about this first before we talk about the actual sectors and other stuff that the analysts were finding. Um, Talked about the rates. I talked about liking JP Morgan, who just reached an all time high. Home Depot. I don't think these things are dynamic. They're not. They, so that's where they were at the time. Um, so, great rate debate. Fed hike path is a wild card. Uh, the um, strategists expect two to more. Oh, at the time, we see, look at that. That's only back in uh, November, early November when we we're still expecting some rate hikes. Now, those are off the table, and that's even better for these guys. You know, we were saying if they eventually stop, they already stop. Um, on the fintech side, um, we I was looking at, uh, at SQ, who we just talked about today in my post, and I said they were a good buy down here. At 50, NVIDIA is another one that's, you know, expected to continue to have success. Um, what happened today is a lot of these guys had a pullback because um, 
now now they're questioning, which which I said this morning, in fact, in the post, I said, you know, I think all this good news is baked in. And now if they don't approve uh, an ETF for cryptocurrency, I think it's all going to collapse, not collapse, but, you know, pull back significantly because everybody's counting on this ETF for crypto. Bitcoin's down like 5% today. Um, Values-based consumption, consumers are, are, are looking for ESG kind of kind of stocks that are sustainable. Um, they, that's a big trend. It's not going to go away. I and mean, this is what we're talking about here is trends. So here I'm saying Amazon is good, Zoom is good. Um, oh, wait, so like, this is ESG. What is this? Then? What was I talking about here? Ethical values. All right. They're, they're, you know what? To be fair, I, I got to tell you, they're kind of the same thing. But <laughs> but people want, you know, what they consider to be. It's it's the younger crowd, you know. They want they, it, and it does. It's all meaningless, you know. We're all skeptical because we're old, but the younger crowd is like they want companies with ethics and so on and so forth. But just because your company says it's ethical doesn't mean it is. That's what we all learn over time. And we just give up on the concept. But young people today, they want companies that aren't polluting. They want companies that are kind to animals and doing things for charity and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we 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 went through all this in the 70s and 80s. We were all told that these companies were doing this and that. And they all turned out to be full of crap in the end. Um, you know, really, everybody's just out for themselves, unfortunately. Um so ESG, you have to that with environmental companies too. These companies say that they're being green and they're not. You know, when you analyze it, they're not. And there's a little brouhaha and then everybody forgets about it and moves on. But global money is moving into ESG. And no matter how many times Fox News denies it or tells you it's over and it's a big con and so on and so forth, it's a real thing. You know, ESG is a real thing. It's a trend. It's going to be here forever. Um, we we in America are the worst country for doing things and caring about the environment in the world. The rest of the world is all on board with like combating global warming and so on and so forth. We're like the renegades of the world. We're just like going on and doing our own thing. And even, you know, and you can see though, even if Biden tries to do something, they fight it tooth and nail, the lobbyists and all that. Um, that's because we have a, a basically flawed political system that allows the people with money to control the system. Uh, that's not going away either, but still the ESG companies are benefiting because the rest of the world doesn't isn't like us. <laughs> so um, I said Ford should pick up. We've uh, invested in Ford. Uh, they have picked up a, a bunch since then. I think they're up 13 now. Uh, and extra energy is a, renew a good, good renewable energy uh, generator. They're fun. Um, big tech is getting, this is a big thing too, a lot of big tech stuff is going to get broken up. AI may get somehow broken up because you can't just concentrate all of the information and all the data into a couple of companies. It's a very, very bad idea. And again, if America doesn't do anything about it, Europe will. And they are. They're already finding Google and finding Apple for privacy violations and data violations and so on and so forth. So you gotta keep your eye on that kind of stuff. Um, the geopolitical policy, as, we, as we're seeing right now, in fact, with geopolitical policy. Um, so now we have this thing in the Red Sea. There's two major things we're shipping right now. The, uh, the Red Sea Channel, which includes the Suez Canal, is being shut down by the Houthi rebels, uh, which, which are basically Iran-paid rebels. And um, and the Panama Canal uh, is also in trouble because it's drying up. Can't get the ships across the Panama Canal if it dries up. And a lot of the, the larger ships can't go through the Panama Canal right now. There's not enough water. It's not high enough. Um, they were just talking about that today in the Times. It's like it's going to cost so many billions to fix and then the fight is over who's going to fix it panama can't afford to fix it we built the panama canal the united states built the panama canal for our in our own interest we took the country of panama which had a fairly uh a fairly narrow 
uh, space between the two oceans and we make it a canal through it. We went down there and said, hey, we're going to build a canal through your country. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, we're going to dig your country, a big giant trench in the middle of your country. And it's going to be for shipping. <laughs> and they went for it for whatever reason. I mean, who knows what kind of force they had or what kind of drives there were. But whatever the case was, Panama allowed us to build the canal uh, at our expense. So we sent our people down there, built this canal, massive, massive project um and times were different back then nobody cared about the environmental impact nobody cared about other things nobody planned for what's going on right now which is the canal is drying up and needs to be basically redug and resupplied from the oceans and billions and billions and billions of dollars have to be spent to fix it and of course you know how the republicans in congress are about us spending money for what they would call foreign aid it's not really foreign aid though we built the thing too so we could have shipping go between uh you know from one side of it from one side of the ocean to the other from the Atlantic to, Atlantic to the Pacific that's that's a really messed up thing and nobody's it, it's nobody's paying attention to it but it's going to drive shipping costs through the roof if it if we can't get that fixed um so essentially it's a bailout for uh for the shipping company but also all the manufacturers I mean, it's it's a cost issue that, that just, it'll add up to billions if we don't fix it. So overall though, RTX, and oh, there's another article today. See, it's funny, I was talking about this stuff two months ago in articles today. Um, military contractors like Raytheon and, uh, and of course Lockheed Martin, who we love, um, they, they are very much going to benefit because everybody's firing all these missiles at each other constantly and it's it's kind of like uh, in the avengers where it's like uh, the, you know tony the missiles have stark written on them no matter who's firing them both sides have stark missiles it's like that i mean basically it doesn't matter who's shooting the missiles it's probably one of our guys um and um What was I saying? Oh, sorry, something came up in the corner of my screen. Um, they're running out of missiles, so they and, and there's an actual backlog of uh, orders for missiles. <laughs> they keep firing them off. Um, people, so whoever has let the, it, it's an interesting trick. It's like whoever has missiles left at the end of all this is going to be the winner. <laughs> the last guy with missiles wins. The conservation of missiles is a new thing we should watch out for. But anyway, so that BHP is is a, a, another good one for general commodities, and I, I should have thought of that because I was looking at Rio today. Um, I want to add Rio back into our thing. Healthcare is, of course, you, look, you can't fight demographics. Everybody's getting older. Everybody needs more and more medical care. Not everybody, but, you know, the the, the boomer generation, the big population bubble, we're getting older and uh, we have more use of, we have more need for medical stuff. Not only that though, but they find more and more things to cure that creates business, right? They didn't, they didn't used to have, well, first of all, COVID is a new thing. Um, this RSV, you see these commercials now, they have, they have commercials. They actually have to promote diseases so that you become aware of them and want to get your vaccine. So they have a vaccine for RSV. It's not a very important thing. I talked about this. It's like a, a, a respiratory infection. It's a very minor one by comparison. There, it, it wouldn't normally be something everybody would go get a shot for. So they make commercials to make everybody think that there's some kind of epidemic of RSV and you should get a shot. But <clears throat> honestly, it's, they, they just sort of figured out a, a vaccine and now they got to make you care enough to go get it. That's how it works. They have to now market the disease and make, and make people more aware of RSV. And if you know, you know this happens, right? It's like the, it's what with Viagra, they have to make people aware of erectile dysfunction to sell Viagra. People are like Viagra, what's that for? It's like it's ED. It's like what's ED? It's like now everybody knows it's ED. Everybody's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so you know, this is how medicine evolves. But they're they're basically so they're curing more and more things, even though those things may not need a cure or may not have been so dire that it was important. But you know. Uh, mRNA was a favorite of mine. They just blasted higher. 
and look how low they were when we were talking about it too, 73 bucks. Um, and Teladoc <clears throat> is another one I like also, and they were way cheap back then. Back, back then, it's like November. <laughs> um, uh, cybersecurity investments, that's a huge thing. AI is making it easier and easier to hack um, because a lot of hacks work on brute force. If you just try something over and over and over again, you know, just try every possible password, right? It's, it's if you write a good algorithm to do that and you time it right, that's another thing. If you have to time it so the requests go in before it times you out and keep it, you know, and keep it running exactly on a sequence, that makes it seem like a human is doing it. <clears throat> so there's all these different ways to attack using AI, and that makes that makes it more important than ever to have these uh, cybersecurity companies. So Palo Alto and CrowdStrike are two of the best ones. May they have both been going up anyway. <clears throat> And uh, supply chain companies also, um, it, it, FedEx, of course, is part of the supply chain uh, um, supply chains, but Taiwan Semiconductor suffers from a broken supply chain. So it's good for Taiwan Semi as we fix this, the supply chain, and FedEx is one of the companies that is being called on to do it and redo their shipping lanes and so on and so forth. And then demographic shifts. <clears throat> demographic shifts, uh, shifts. <laughs> and I talked about uh, birth rates and longevity uh, changes. And that's another thing, people living longer, also again with the pharma though, right? People living longer is great for the pharma industry. Um, you know, it's, it's all about an aging population though. In all cases, the whole world aging population. It's very different. An aging population and less young people Declining birth rates, aging population, going to be a lot of old people in the future, and that means that things that benefit old people. So, um, Johnson and Johnson is an interesting one because uh, depends for one. <laughs> so a lot more depends in the future. It, did Japan cross the threshold like uh, uh, two years ago? Japan crossed the th a threshold where they were selling more adult depends than ba than diapers. So there were more depends being sold in Japan than there were diapers. <laughs> it's like that's a crazy thing to think about. Um, Pro Lodge is also their logistics firm um, that that work with um, real estate and for um, uh, they they specialize with healthcare in the healthcare industry for uh, uh, you know think of adult care facilities that need to be done and also all the medical facilities that are around. I mean, I live in Florida. It's amazing. There's there's got to be like five different uh, emergency clinics within a mile of me. I mean, that's an incredible business they have. So this is a good side way to, to invest in real estate because they're not really a real estate company um, per se, but they are uh, consulting on real estate and they get paid for that. So those are all companies we were watching and they're all doing actually very good as far as I can tell. I think all of them actually are doing well since I've been looking at them. Um, then today... No, not today. I shouldn't go there. Sorry. Change my mind. Don't forget we got the Fed coming up too. We're gonna see what the Fed minutes look like. Um. Yeah, this was crazy. Let's go look at the original article. In fact, I'll show you the original article, and you'll see why it only pays to work off the summary. Um. Oh, what else do we talk about? Let's see. Oh, that poor plane. Oh, here's the thing, right? So so this is what's going on now in the Red Sea, right? Because you have to avoid, you can't go through the Red Sea in the Suez Canal. You can't go that way. Um, so now they're going down around Africa and it's adding like nine days or 10 days to the to the trip. So, you know, you pay for ships per day. It was, it's very easy to calculate. It was 25 days, right? Now it's 34 days, so you basically it's going to be 40% more time to pay for ships. But also, 
there aren't enough ships. If you 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 also have to add forty percent more ships to the route. That's where you run into trouble. It's not just the trip, and don't forget they come back empty too. So you've got to add even. Let's just stick with the forty percent number for simplicity's sake, though. You to fill this. The, I'm not, I'm pointing my finger like an idiot. Uh, to to fill this. To fill this line, this conga line of ships, right, that is supposed to be continuously supplying from here to here, right? You want to supply Europe from Asia, you need to continuously have ships coming every single day, right? So that they have a continuous line of ships that do it every day here, right? But when you say Cho change the route, it doesn't work that way. You can't just add 40% more ships. There aren't, they're not there. It takes years and years and years to build more ships. And if they did build 40% more ships, they would have an unbelievable glut of ships as soon as this thing uh, works itself out, if it ever does. But so, you know, think about the, the concept of this thing. There's nowhere near enough ships, so it's not, not going to just cost 40% more because it's a 40% increase in time, but now there's not enough ships. Now you have 40% less ships than you need to maintain a continuous supply. So what's going to happen? Everybody's going to be bidding on the ships and bidding on the routes and bidding on the supply and the shortages, blah, blah, blah. And you're right back to inflation. So Europe's going to get hit with inflation, you know, pretty soon because this is this is all happening now and it's feeding into the supply chain and raising prices. And And, and, and like I said, and now getting stuff from Europe to California can no longer go here through this little thin piece over here because that canal is drying out. And we've got the dollar climbing since the uh, new year started. And what's that oil? Oil is all over the place. Um, here's the Hang Seng. I, it's, you know, China is talking about stimulus and fixing things and doing this and doing that. Uh, I almost want to believe me. I almost want to call it a buy here, the Hang Seng. Might be fun to play China long, like FXI or something like that, because it's been beaten up and it's not too risky at this point. But, um, uh, you know, and, and you see the RSI was down at 30, and I, it's, it's the same calculation we talked about this morning. The RSI is at 30. It's going to go back to 50 at some point. You don't know when, but at some point. So if you make a bet that says it's going to go back to 50, that's a perfectly good bet. What does that mean? That means a 66% increase from where you bought them. So you bought them at 15,000, right? So 15,000 times 1.66 is 24.9. Ooh, that would be nice. Look at that, all the way back to 24.9. Whoop. There you go. No, oh no, what am I talking about? 24 and 25. There. So so hopefully, as we normalize, we're gonna get back to here. Uh Asia's factories cut back on weak demand. So you know, demand is a problem everywhere, though. That's that's you gotta watch this. And again, only if China does what it says. So the, the bouncers are acting like China is going to, you know, just because they mention stimulus, they're gonna do it. Until they do it, you don't know. But China doesn't have the same, it's a little different in China than if Biden says, I want to do a stimulus package, and then Congress fights about it for nine months. In China, if Xi says he's going to do a stimulus package, he's probably going to do it. The question is, what kind of package and how big and how much of an effect will it have? He's done plenty of stimuluses before, and they, a lot of them fizzled out. <clears throat> this is China's home sales for the last couple of years. I mean, this is awful. Anyway, all right, so Bloomberg has compiled a nice list. Here, here's what the actual list looks like. So this is what analysts think about whatever's. Base case. So first of all, there's no, this is a perfect job for AI, right? First of all, they think you're going to read all this. <laughs> And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on for page after page after page. Each you can see the topic changes up here, right? For what they're talking about. It's it's nicely done, except 
it's too much for a human being to, to get through. It's like, it's ridiculous. Um, but I appreciate the raw data. I really do. So here's a ton of people's opinions about what's going to happen in 2024. Um, the base case, prospects increasing for recession. Uh, we see recession. We expect 2024 to be the year where central banks successfully orchestrated soft landing, Bank of America. Uh, BlackRock. Slower growth, higher higher inflation, higher interest rates, and greater volatility. That's interesting. Uh, Brandywine, odds of recession are not trivial. However, it is most likely given our constructive view on inflation. Uh, we believe 2024 should be a strong year for investors in general. Outlook for 24 is graduated U-shaped recovery. So then, then you take all this, and I told Claude to read it. Because, Claude, by the way, Claude is the only AI that can handle it, as far as I understand. I mean, it's... I could feed Claude that much information and he could read it and analyze it, which was great. So Claude took, I, at first I asked him to just analyze it. He gave me an overall thing on it. He said the base case is for continued slowdown, avoiding a recession, inflation expected to continue falling, but remain sticky and above central rank tar bank targets. This is actually what I, this is my expectation too. So good. Um, this is, this is expected to lead central banks like the Fed and ECB to cut rates in mid-2024. Now, I don't agree with the way he said it, because, I mean, if, 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 if inflation is sticky and above targets, it's, that's not what leads them to cut rates. Um, but as long as it slows down and stabilizes, I think they'll, they'll, they'll want to make at least one cut just to sort of goose the economy a little bit and, mean, and avoid a hard landing. Um, so it's like, it's literally, it's like a hard landing, soft landing. It's like adjusting a plane and pulling the nose up a little bit so you don't uh, crash into the runway. You know, you're actually aiming to go kind of level out and, and find a, a proper place where the economy can rest for a while. Uh, there's optimism around equities, positive but muted to return expectations. Um, bonds are expected to post gains. Uh, and again, high, if bonds are gaining higher yields, um, these aren't necessarily reasons the Fed is going to pull back. Um, risk, downside risk is a deeper slowdown. It's not, hasn't gone away yet. Europe is a big problem of the, the, the war in the Ukraine is a problem. The, the, now the Suez Canal thing is a problem. The Red Sea thing, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, and, and also we're all ignoring the debt. That's, you know, keep that in mind that we're completely ignoring $34 trillion worth of U.S. debt. And that's just, it's, I, I want to say it's wrong, but there's the uh, new math of the economy where, where, you know, you, you say deficits don't matter. It don't matter because you can just keep printing money. And if you keep printing money and people keep accepting the money, it's fine. There's no competition to our money, so we can do this. But for how long? We're just building a weaker and weaker uh, uh, foundation for the value of our currency. And so as we do it, uh, you know, we, we're $34 trillion in debt. 15 trillion in the last 10 years, right? So basically 1.5 trillion dollars a year, which is almost 10% of our GDP of, you know, you have to realize, I mean, when we started it was 10% of our GDP, now our GDP is bigger. But back then it was basically, we're spending almost 10% of our GDP per year in order to get 5%, 4%, 3% economic growth. That's that is the definition of an artificial economy. This economy doesn't work unless we pump in $1.5 trillion a year. The deficit this year, and I know we look at this all the time, so whatever. Oh, there you go. See, it's still running. So $33.9 trillion. The deficit this year is $1.7 billion. It's still $1.5 trillion a year. We're still running the same average deficit. How long can you keep that up, really? Our GDP is not our GDP. Our GDP is our GDP with a 10% boost. Where does that money come from? 
from heaven. It comes it's free. The Fed, the Fed runs a printing press and goes, dit, 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 and here's your money. And they put 100 billion, 150 billion, basically a month into, <laughs> into the economy. It's come from nowhere, just made up money. So you're getting paid in printed dollars. You know, it's almost counterfeiting. 10% of the money that you're getting paid is money they just printed. 10% of the money you spend is money that was just printed. It's fake. Um, and again, there's no repercussion because there's no challenges. And how are they going to challenge it? You know, the euro, the, the, the dollar is 60% of all global currency. The euro is 30 over 30% of all global exchanges. So between them, they're 90%. Who, who, and, and you know, they talk about this all the time. There's always saber rattling because the, the people who trade currencies love to do this because, you know, these small currencies, and that includes the yuan, that includes the yen, that includes the, the, the pound, uh, the franc, all the small currencies is so insignificant on the global scheme of things that you can just make a rumor and, and send them up and down. So when you start talking, especially the yuan, because you can take the yuan, which is, two percent of global transactions and you can take the yuan and you can tell people that china is going to uh, back their currency with gold or the russia is going to start backing their currency in gold and the ruble will be the new official currency that people trade because it'll be the only gold-backed currency it's it's, it's insane though are you gonna are we all gonna run out and get rubles now no it's nobody nobody wants a ruble um but any kind of rumors like that can have a drastic effect on the currencies that they have rumors about. Not the dollar. I mean, it actually can affect the dollar. People go in and out of the dollar all the time. But the dollar is going to go back to normal pretty quickly, whereas you can have a, a, a rumor driving up the yuan or something like that. It can last a week or two, and you can make a fortune trading it because you know it's bullshit. You know you started the rumor. You know when you're going to stop the rumor. You know when you're going to let it play out. Um, so that it's a, it's a market ripe for manipulation, but the more but so the point is so so who's going to challenge the dollar supremacy? Who's going to who's going to point out that the dollar is the emperor that has no clothes? That we just keep printing these things with with nothing really backing it up. And 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 to that point, right? There's uh two three trillion dollars worth of bitcoin how much bitcoin is there there's um if it's 40 it's only 42 now 42,000 times 11 million is oh that's all so do that right No, so it's 4,200. So it's $460 billion worth of Bitcoin. Let me try that again. There's 11 million Bitcoin. That's all they were on the world. Times $42,000. Yeah. So there's half a trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin. No, there isn't. <laughs> because nobody actually paid... Four hundred sixty-two trillion dollars for million for eleven million bitcoins. What happened is some bitcoins traded and the price went up and up and up. Maybe ten percent of all the bitcoins traded. Ninety percent of them are still in the wallets from people who had them when it cost ten thousand bitcoins to buy a pizza. So a lot of people have a lot of unrealized profit in Bitcoin, but it's unrealized because they don't try to sell it. If you try to sell it, you will realize that it's not worth what you think it's worth. And and the, the, you know people, it's the same thing with stocks. But I mean, people really it's don't understand. So so we've created. So now this four hundred and sixty billion dollars is part of our economy, and Bitcoin doubled last year. So two hundred and fifty billion dollars of Bitcoin value was created last year. Oh, and by the way, the IRS is going to nail people who don't declare their bitcoins. Um, I mean, seriously bad things. So be careful if you're trading these things. Um, 
So because it because there's 260 billion dollars of tax, 250 billion dollars of taxable gains in Bitcoin from last year, and the IRS is like, if you don't declare it, you will go to jail. So we count that as GDP growth. We had this many bitcoins, this many dollars worth of bitcoins, and now we have this many dollars worth of bitcoins. Therefore, we have more assets. This is the same logic that leads a housing bubble to collapse, or any kind of any kind of asset bubble collapses this way, because no, it isn't. Good luck finding some moron to give you four hundred and sixty-two billion dollars for all the bitcoins in the world. It's not going to happen. Even if somebody had that, even if Elon Musk was that crazy, uh, he's got $400 billion. Um, even if, if if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates got together and said, let's buy all the Bitcoins in the world and give it, <laughs> and think about how stupid that is, right? <laughs> Just thinking about the concept makes you realize how ridiculous this valuation is. So Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos get together and say, let's stop fooling around and let's just buy all the Bitcoins in the world and then we'll have all the Bitcoins and they'll have our money. <laughs> and we'll be so rich. It's just, it's ridiculous. Um, so anyway, bottom line is you have to realize that that to some extent, a very large piece, $250 billion of what we call GDP growth is not GDP growth because it's just some bullshit big valuation bubble in Bitcoin. Same thing happens when you have real estate bubbles also though. So you have these incredibly stupid gains in GDP for no reason because it's all going to reverse later. And they always talk about how great it is when it goes up and they never talk about how bad it is when it goes down. Um, So Europe is, you know, teetering. That's where the war is. And China uh, has their own problems right now. They, and China still, and China has been shoving money and shoving money and shoving money into preventing a real estate collapse of trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of unrealized losses in real estate. I mean, literally, they can't possibly sell. They have so many vacant buildings and, and they, they have vacant cities. They have entire cities that are vacant. People built cities the way we build developments down in Florida, right? Like all, the, all of a sudden you see somebody decides to like turn some swamp into a development and they sell it though. Eventually, eventually people move in and buy it. They're not in China. In China, they build entire cities and then they go, well, nobody actually wants to go there. <laughs> so, oops. Um, so there are trillions of dollars of losses piled up in these in these unused things and also china's population is growing at a faster pace and so on and so forth and now they've got very now they're trying to encourage population growth because china really screwed themselves um from right from pretty much 1980 until last year i think hang on let's check that's an important fact um what was the time frame of china's one I'm not the first person who asked that question. 1980. Oh, that's right. So from 1980 until 2016, China had a policy of one child per family. That is 35 years of policy. Two full generations of people where they decided to have only one child per family. So that creates the mother age discrepancy bubble of all time because now you've got all these old people getting older and only half as many young people to support them so now since it ended in 19 uh, in 2015 okay so the youngest kids from that bubble are, are 10 but that means their parents are probably 30s but their parents were also one child parents so if you're only 30, you were a one-child parent, right? So you have to go all the way up till 20-year-olds before you have potentially two-child parents before the policy was enacted. And the parents of 20-year-olds are 40 to 50-year-olds. So people who are 40 to 50, there's basically twice as many people from the age 45 up in China as there are people below 45. 
that is a population disaster of epic proportions. And they did it to themselves and they can't, and how do you undo it? You can't undo it. You can't undo it by telling people now to have three children or four children to try to make up for it. It doesn't work that way because then you have way too many young children and way too many old people at the same time. And who's going to take care of the young people? Who's going to teach all these kids, whatever, not the, you know, theoretically, I guess the old people could teach the kids, but it's just crazy. Um, and it's not, you know, it's hard to dictate this kind of policy. So, <laughs> so anyway, so they have a very big demographic time bomb go going on in China right now. And that's, and, and again, when you talk about themes and what's going to go on, you got to look at things that they can't be stopped. Nothing's going to change. Certainly not. In, so with China, nothing's going to change. That's not going to go away. You can't make that problem go away. There's no amount of money or anything you can throw at it to fix it in within a decade. That's the fact of China. That's the fact of Japan. Also, very strong aging population. Japan didn't have a policy of it, but they also effectively had a one child. They had one child per family for years. Most of Europe has one child per family now. You know, I mean, I, I guess as societies develop, it's, it's a sort of natural thing to have less kids, right? You're not as worried about needing spares and so on and so forth. And they don't work the farm anyway. That used to be the logic of having lots of kids. We see, you know, lots of kids, more people helping at the farm. So these are not things that are likely to change. Um, Portfolios, diversification, uh, very active management. We got to be careful. We got to always watch things. The outlook stresses are high, uncertainty is elevated. The portfolios need to be resisted. So, this is his uh, take on the entirety of what we read. Then I said to him after that, I said, okay, I want a detailed summary of each category, though, not just the summary of the whole thing. So, then he went through the, the summary of the, of the different categories. So, the base case, is people are expecting a slowdown, uh, inflation falls but remains above. So these are these are fantastic footnotes for the whole year to be watching. Central banks uh, expected to cut rate. This is a, the majority of analysts, and these are the top analysts. These are the real, you know, top 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 guys to be asking. And Bloomberg did very extensive surveys here. <clears throat> Doesn't mean they're right. Just means that this is a consensus, which is important to know. Um, so everybody thinks it's going to be a soft landing, basically. That's where we're at. Slowdown, global growth is decelerating. Uh, Europe is more vulnerable. Corporate earnings are going to drop across regions, tighter financial conditions. Uh, you know, all, all this, these are macros that are going to be coming. So you got to think about this in your, in your investments. Is we, Are we affected by this stuff? I mean, of course, we're affected by it. But to what extent is my company going to be sensitive to it? Um, recession especially in Europe, high debt levels, policy errors by the banks, recession risks are elevated, rate cuts, we're expected to cut rate in 2024. <clears throat> but that doesn't, but that says when disinflation is seen as sustainable. I don't believe that's actually going to happen though. I think it's interesting. I, I think that especially right now, the shipping issue is huge. So I think that's going to push it through. If, if oil hadn't come down so drastically, we would not have had these disinflation sort of numbers that we've had recently and i think that oil has nowhere to go but up right now and i think that um you know we might hit 60 before the summer you know before before we get back to may and the and the and the start of the summer driving and all that and travel season but i don't think oil is going to go much lower than 60. I don't think it's actually going to even hit 60 but let's say oil gets to 60 even it's not enough of a change now to matter coming off of 95 a year ago and um and then it's and then it's going to almost certainly go up from here up from 70 so um that's not going to help and the shipping thing is not going to help uh the supply shortages caused by the shipping thing where i said there aren't enough ships to you can't enlarge the supply line if you don't have more ships you're just going to have 
more ships on a longer line spaced out more which means now they're going to take longer to come back and longer to, for, to be resupplied and you're going to cause shortages the shortage the shortage variable is going to be shipping and that will be great for fedex because when you think about it fedex has to, is you know the more expensive alternative you're going to turn to when you can't ship things so so fedex's planes and, and ups's planes will be buzzing day and night uh which is not bad, which is not good for the environment unfortunately um rate cuts oh yeah we talked about it. okay <clears throat> so high rates uh you know you know they talk about rates being about pre-pandemic levels but they were artificially low anyway we were coming off um you know we were coming off very low rates either way so you know 3.5 percent is essentially a normal fed rate 3.5 4 percent somewhere around there not two percent not not anything crazy so we're only just about four we're at four seven five or five five let's say we're at five now so they'll cut them to one they'll come to four but that's not going to be a big uh change from now on that's where that's going to be the normal rates uh growth 2.5 percent us one percent pathetic considering we're spending 10 percent of our gdp to get one percent growth <laughs> um and this is a how long are we going to keep it up it's just insane how long are we going to keep doing this um and if the and it doesn't matter what we spend at home if the whole world starts going into recession that's 50 percent of the s p revenues come from overseas there's no way to avoid it um inflation uh three percent in the u.s closer to two percent for europe by the year end so europe will be happy at two percent we're we're at three percent that's not that's not even where the fed is allowed to really lower their rates um um globally uh that doesn't say much u.s expected to outperform other regions with a mild recession or uh, the election is going to be chaos, by the way, and they're going to bring up, you know, the Republican strategy for the election is to tell everybody how bad the economy is. That in itself can end up causing a recession. When you tell everyone how awful the economy is, and that's and every day you are talking about the destruction of America and so on and so forth, you can depress people. And that's why they call it a depression. Everybody's depressed. So a recession can be tipped by what's going to happen this campaign season um europe uh obviously much bigger trouble the war is close to home uh their their prices of fuel from russia have gone through the roof um they're trying not to use the russian fuel it's, it's a lot of stuff um japan like i said a population bomb in japan as well um and and they have Oh, Japan, we, you know, we're we're concerned about being thirty-four trillion dollars in debt. Won't well, doesn't sound much when you compare it to Japan, who are three hundred percent of their GDP in debt. They got a five trillion dollar economy, they got about fifteen trillion dollars in debt. And it, it seems meaningless, right? Like, oh well, so what? We we've got twenty-three trillion. It just means, you know, I mean, imagine if you if you earn a hundred thousand a year. And you're spending a hundred and thirty thousand a year, so you're going thirty thousand into debt every year, and you owe already three hundred thousand dollars, and that three hundred thousand dollars has a thirty thousand a year interest rate. So even if you cut back your spending severely, just to pay the interest payments on the money you owe, you you need thirty thousand dollars. So your hundred thousand dollars after taxes. That you earn is let's say seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, let's say it's seventy. So let's say you have seventy thousand left. Probably not. They're probably sixty-five thousand left. And half of that money is going to debt service, leaving you thirty-five thousand dollars to actually spend to live with your family. So you're making a hundred thousand dollars, and you're living on thirty-five thousand dollars. But like I said, you're not because you're you're living you're living as if you weren't in debt and you're maintaining your home and kids going to college and blah 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 and there's no way you can keep your expenses under 130,000 a year even if you, you cut 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 
and you still can't get to a point where you're going to be able to pay down your debt. It's over. It is not possible for you to ever pay down your debt. It'll never happen. And meanwhile, for what reason do people keep lending you money? It makes no sense. Every year, every time someone lends you more money, it makes less and less sense. You've just gone more and more into debt. Go, same goes for the US, but for Japan, when you're 300% of your GDP in debt, it makes absolutely no sense. There's no possible way to justify lending Japan money. It makes no sense whatsoever. And that's the second biggest economy in the world. Well, China, China, sorry, China is the third biggest economy in the world. Yet they're going to go bankrupt. There's no possible way, again, without modern monetary theory, which says debts don't matter and debts don't matter if nobody, if nobody ever collects and nobody ever calls them on it and you just keep lending them money, it's fine. But there will come a point at which right now Japan 30% of their 30 percent of their net revenues goes to debt payment. So they, they take in whatever, I don't, I don't know the numbers exactly, but you know, so let's say they take in a trillion dollars of, of taxes and, and, and income for the government, right? So 300 billion is debt service. <coughs> and, and that and that. So, so you get to a point where your debt service is going to cross your uh, half of your income, and then then you then you're operating on a deficit, and then you've got the deficit like like us. Look at our example. We're hitting a trillion dollars a year in debt service at 34 trillion, three percent. It's a trillion dollars a year of debt service. So just the service to pay the interest on the debt that we already owe is a trillion dollars a year. We're running a 1.7 trillion dollar deficit. We take in six trillion dollars a year. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. We take in. I'm sorry. We spend six trillion dollars a year. Two trillion of it is deficit spending. Um, we're collecting four trillion dollars a year. Eventually, though, if we keep doing what we're doing now, in in 15 years, not long, in 15 years, the debt will be another $30 trillion and we'll need $2 trillion to pay the interest on the debt. And, and then we're, we're Japan. At that point, we're effectively Japan. We're taking one third of our, one third of our, of our spending will be deficit, but it can't be one third of our spending because how could we cut a trillion dollars from our spending? Two trillion of the spending is debt. So, well, you can't cut $2 trillion from the $4 trillion. You can't cut half the government spending. And it's, and it's not even that because most of the money, most of what they call government spending, well, here you go. Let's take a look. Most of what you call government spending is um, Social Security. Uh, do, 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 do they bring it up? Here it is. $1.3 trillion Social Security, $1.4 trillion Medicare. So basically $3 trillion. Three trillion dollars of this spending is Social Security, Medicare. This is money the government owes us. We paid for this. It's a service that they're supposed to provide, not charity. We worked our entire lives to get this money back. This is our savings account that the government is entrusted with. What a joke. Um, so this is where we are. So if you look at government spending, Here's the, here's the tax revenue, 4.3 trillion, 4.4 trillion dollars, basically. Um, so this can't, if you say that can't be touched, that means only three trillion dollars is actually spent. One trillion is spent on the military. That leaves two trillion dollars of discretionary spending. So when we go another 30 trillion dollars into debt, which will take 15 years at this, or not even 20, it'll take 15 years, trust me, at this level. Um, so it'll take 15 years at this level. So we go that much more into debt. Then another trillion dollars will be needed to service the debt. Where'd that go? Debt service. Oh, there. So another trillion will be needed to do serve debt service. And that's only if rates stay at the uh, the um, two 2% two level that we're paying. That's not going to happen. It's going to go to 3% and 4%. That means the debt service can go to $4 trillion. 
So would you, you know, would you keep lending us money? I sure wouldn't. <laughs> Yet it's happening. And that's modern monetary theory that the deficit doesn't matter. It's just a number. You just keep printing money. You just keep paying your debt. Doesn't matter what the number is because we just keep printing money, print, paying the debt. That's bullshit though. That's, that's, not, that's like economics for people who don't think. Um, eventually, something bad is going to happen. <laughs> so we got that to look forward to. UK. They're a mess. <laughs> they have the same politics we do and the same messed up in government that we do. Um, this Brexit thing has been a total disaster for them. They still haven't fixed that. A lot of problems. Um, China, insane problems. And they say, but, but policy stimulus stabilize. Everybody believes that, that they're going to be able to stimulate. But then again, China used to be debt free. They used to have that on us. Now they're almost as in debt as we are. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell with China because everything's a secret. But, you know, they're basically estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of, the, of the, as, as in debt as we are, 150% of the GDP. So they're doing the same thing that we're doing. That's why, you know, people in glass houses, when you hear about China taking over with the wand, that's bullshit. That's that's because before, before 2008, China was seen as being essentially debt-free. After 2008, they spent trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars on that. And then they spent trillions and trillions and trillions on COVID. Don't forget, they closed the entire country for a couple of years. That was, a, you know, way more drastic than us. And they kept everything afloat with government money. Um, and that's how China got to be that in debt. And China's a much smaller economy than we are, but they spent incredible amounts of money. Um, plus building all that, the high-speed rail networks and the airports all over the place. And it's really empty, empty rail lines, empty airports, because it was a planned economy. They said, we're going to build these cities and we're going to connect them with these trains and we're going to service them with these airports. And they did it, but it turned out that, that, that it wasn't a good plan. You know, one good thing about capitalism is you enable things to grow organically. Um, then they'll, they'll, they'll grow, um, you know, as demand dictates. And that's a, a very efficient system for capital allocation other than all the cheating. All right, anyway, time for the Fed, so let's get through this. <clears throat> Let me see if there's any video. Oh, let's see what they... So the minutes came out, and obviously nothing to get excited about in the minutes. And we'll find out why shortly. Oh, my voice, damn it. Still, don't, still can't talk for very long. Let's go two hours, no problem. <clears throat> All right. So the dollar, um, they, they don't know. That's bullshit. <laughs> they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so, so at a certain point, are the government's ever going to have a come to Jesus moment where they say, oh, you know, we can't just keep throwing money into this fire. But if you're not going to do that, then what? That's, and that, that's the reality of modern, modern monetary theory. Nobody can do this. Every country's in debt. Every country's running a deficit. Every country can't afford to pay their bills. So they all ignore it. Frankly, the, the rational thing to do, just pretend it's not there until it until something, because there's something that's going to happen is going to be so drastic that you won't even recognize the planet by the time we're done. How do you fix this? Everybody would have to go on some massive austerity. You, basically, there's going to be a default. That's what the, the most likely end of this is some global default is going to happen. And there'll be huge disruptions in everything. And, 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 and it'll be a horrifying chaos, like 2008, except that if it keeps going. Um, so that either that or there's going to have to be some sort of a it's a global agreement to fund some sort of debt forgiveness plan on a global scale. That, that would take like, you know, we can't even agree on, on we can't even agree to stop the planet from melting. 
I don't know if that's, and that's part of it too, though. There's a lot of people who basically don't believe the planet's going to last more than 50 to 100 years. So it doesn't, so we can keep this, we can keep this bullshit going with the debt. <laughs> so why should we stop? Why suffer? Why should we inconvenience ourselves when it's all going to come to an end anyway? And that's a sad thing. But I, I, I got to tell you, my kids both in college now, and I would say the majority the majority of people in their schools that I talk to believe that it's not even worth having kids. Most of the kids I talk to do not plan to have kids. They don't think that they don't think the world's going to last long enough to um, give their kids a decent life. It's very sad. <clears throat> and and of course, but you know, because because that's the thing. If you know, what are we doing about it? We're not doing anything to fix it. <laughs> If we're not doing anything to fix it, it is going to fall apart. So they have no hope because they see it that way. It's very black and white. You know how kids are very black and white about things. It's very black and white for them. They're like, the world is definitely falling apart, and the adults are not doing anything about it. Uh, anyway, elections. Half the GDP holds pivotal elections in 2024. Right, well, that happens all the time. Um, da, 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 da. We'll see what happens. And it's got, got, who knows? I imagine how different this is all going to be in 2025. Trump is back in power. Oh my God. It's all going to hit. All, everything crazy is going to happen again. I don't know if we can afford it again. I don't know if we can afford four more years of insanity. Um, nor can we afford four more years of, of not doing anything like we like Biden's done. I mean, basically, all he's done is sort of like, kept things going but that's you can't do that either we need massive changes um the russia war the middle east uh, da, 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 geopolitics we said that oh i see being specific everyone expects a soft landing um balance sheet resilience and cash flow strength of the key stock attributes that's what we look for in our watch list duration Long dated bonds are, are, are better if growth is slowing, shorter maturities uh, reduce the sensitivity. Bond supply is, is, is going to be plenty of debt to buy. That's one thing. Heavy sovereign debt in, influence issuance to finance deficit. That's, that is for sure 100% true. Um, and again, more supply requires higher. Wow, this is very, this is such a great summary. I mean, how you, the three are spot on, right? More bonds means you have to attract investors. How do you attract investors to a bond? By raising the rate of the bond, not by lowering it. And this is a problem for the Fed. Oh, speaking of the Fed, let's get back to that. So this is a problem for the Fed because if the Fed lowers rates and the bonds require a higher rate to trigger an auction, then there's a disconnect between the Fed yield and the bond rate. And what that does is it shows the Fed has lost control. And that's the thing they can't afford. Is they can't afford to let people know that they can't control this thing. But they can't because that's the fact. The fact is they've got to sell $150 billion worth of bonds. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. It's $150 billion new dollars worth of bonds every month is our borrowing but we also roll over uh 200 billion dollars worth of bonds per month at least so somehow the u.s alone has to peddle about 400 billion dollars worth of bonds every month just the u.s we have to do the rollovers and we have to issue new debt and go further into debt and we have to do that and pretend that we're giving a fair rate of return at 4% or 5%. And that's what happened to Greece. It works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't and people start downgrading you and looking at your debt and saying, you can't pay this debt. This is We, we advise people not to buy U.S. bonds. And then the U.S. says, well, how about for 6%? Are you pricing in the risk for people holding your notes? And then you go, how about 7%? And Greece kept saying, how about, until they got to 20% before they could get people to put money back in. 
happened really quickly. Once people lose faith in your currency and they don't believe that you're, you know, I'm giving you a hundred thousand dollars to put in a bond. If I think your currency is going down, then you better pay me a much higher rate of return because I've got the risk of holding your currency too. That's also in the bond. So there's two risks that you're taking as a bondholder. You're taking, there's a default risk. Will they pay me back at all? Then there's the risk of the currency. If they do pay me back, what are those dollars going to be worth when they pay me back? And then there's the interest rate. Is the interest rate going to keep up with inflation? Think of how many different things can go wrong. And where's my fin biz? Why can I never find it? There it is. Currencies. You. All right. So. If I bought a 10 year note in 2008, the dollar was at 120 in 2002. In 2012, the dollar is at 80. So that's down 33%. And I've lost 33% on the currency that is returned to me. You're giving me back $100,000, but that $100,000 is worth 33% less than it was. So it really doesn't matter what kind of interest you gave me here. I lost 33% on the freaking bank, on the dollars that you've returned to me. That's currency risk. So part of the reason we were able to sustain these very low rates is because people were willing to invest in the dollar because the expectation of the dollar was it would get back to 100. And if the dollar gets back to 100, then you go from 80 to 100, you're making 20% on the dollar. So you're buying dollars or giving, you know, whatever, you know, you see, we're Americans, we don't think of buying dollars, but if you're European, you're buying dollars. The first thing you're doing is buying dollars. You take the dollars, you buy the bond. So the European takes the dollars and says, oh, the dollar's pretty cheap now, I'll buy some dollars and I'll put those into a bond and the bond will pay me uh, two or 3%, but I'm gonna get 20% on the way up. So my effective rate is going to be over 10 years, it's gonna be 4% per year uh I'm, I'm sorry 20 it's 25 so it's two point i'm sorry it's 25% up from here right so my my effective return is 2.5% a year gain in the currency plus 2.5% gain on the yield is 5% that's a good rate of return i'm happy but then inflation kicks in and all of a sudden it's like oh no now i've got to worry about inflation and i didn't make money anyway because inflation outpaced my 5% So it's all connected. It's very holistic. You know, when you really, when you do the market properly, it's very holistic. <clears throat> all right, let's see what those Fed guys are up to. First of all, let's wake Warren up. <clears throat> He's got to be fed these things. Okay. I would like to compare the minutes of the prior Fed meeting with today's release. What? Now you know what I should let's let's get a summary first. Let's do that. So Fed. F-O-M-C, meeting calendar. Two o two three Statement. Honey, whoa. Is it going to be in, is it going to be now? No. This is weird. That's two o two four. Here, oh, here they are. That's weird. Um. Okay, so open a new window. Da, 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 da. 
Right. Here's the actual statement. Voting against. Oh. Okay. Ah. Please analyze uh, summarize and analyze the Fed minutes from the last meeting. Hmm. Pay special attention to clues on hmm, where they stand on rate hikes in the future and their take on inflation and the economy going into 2024. Hmm? Quote, quote, hopefully you can read it all too much. Oh, mm. damn it. <laughs> That's what he's telling me. Well, <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's very annoying. Summarize and analyze the Fed minutes. Paying particular. Attention to inflation expectations, economic expectations, and their stance on rate hikes going into 202. Too long, ah, said Claude. Da 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 da. da. See, it's too long, too long. How you doing, Claude? You're spinning. Why are you spinning? I hope he's not down. What is going on here? Yep, he's also logged out. That's me, right? Oh, if I remember right, I just continued Claude with... Is that right? Yep. Aren't I clever? Fed minutes analysis, inflation expectations, economic outlook, and 2024 rate hikes. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? It's like beyond, you know, chat GPT can't even deal with this.
<clears throat> okay, overall core PCE um, remain near 2%, longer term inflation expectations and surveys with little change. Participants noted the decline in long term inflation compensation may indicate some lowering of long run expectations. Economic outlook participants reviewed recent data indicating continued economic growth and strong labor market. So everything's rosy from this report. Some participants downgraded their economic assessment modestly due to tighter financial conditions. Risk seen as roughly balanced, but downside risks have increased recently. Monetary policy. Most participants judge it appropriate to raise rates. Oh, 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 no wonder the market's selling down. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Wow. Most participants judged it appropriate to raise rates at this meeting, but they didn't. Participants generally expected that some further gradual rate increases would likely be appropriate. Wow. Oh, wow. I can't believe the market's holding up. <laughs> this is not good. Timing of future adjustments to depend on. It. So this is not what they said at all. They and they didn't say much. They have not. They said very little since this meeting. Many noted in light of recent developments, less clarity on appropriate extension timing and future firm. The minutes indicate participants for the economy evolving largely as expected with solid growth. Uh, wow. <laughs> so so they're not really saying they're not going to hike rates again. They're basically saying they're on pause. And of course, they, you know, how can you raise rates at a Christmas meeting? Wow. That is now we're going to have to read that carefully because that's crazy. That is so not. All right, let's do this. Let's uh, have them compare this. Holy cow. Hmm. Well, ugh. Control C. Mm. Claude. Ah, wow. Here are the minutes of the prior meeting. Please highlight what has changed from this meeting through the newer one you already summarized. I find we learn the most from what is from analyzing the changes. It's good to actually tell them what you're trying to do. Um, okay, so while he's doing that, let us take a read, because holy cow. <clears throat> okay, I can't read the whole thing because I got no voice, but... Do, 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 do. Long run. Uh, from the 2018 meeting. What? Oh. Is this like the totally wrong year? <laughs> oh my God, no wonder that was so weird. Oh my God, that was strange. So... Twenty twenty four, no minutes. Son of a bitch. So twenty twenty three, we're supposed to have the minutes of this meeting. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> no, wait, no, 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 no. We had a meeting December 12th. There should be minutes released. This meeting October 31st was released November 21st. This one on the 12th released today, and that was scheduled on the calendar. 
Oh, so this is weird. So the so the problem is the minutes have not been released. That's what's going on. Hmm. When will Fed minutes be released? Three weeks after the date of the policy decision. Fed December minutes are released today, 2 p.m. Okay, I'm not crazy. Barron says they're going to be released. Wednesday, January 3rd, 19... Wow, this is weird. Okay. So they're supposed to be released, but they haven't been released. That's why that whole thing was so wacky. All right, so we know nothing. <laughs> so... Oh, there they are. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, poor Claude. He's wasting all his time. Wow. Uh, oh, hang on. How, how do you delete a chat? This is a good thing about Claude is you can do, he, he, he does, he's not gonna remember this. So it's like, oh, wasted your time, sorry. Oh no, I should have kept the thing. Now I gotta say it all again. Okay, now now there'll be some sanity to this thing. Holy cow. <laughs> okay. Please summarize and analyze the Fed minutes of their recent meeting. Pay particular attention to there take on inflation rate hikes And then we paste. Go, Claude. All right. Now copy this one. Thank you. 
Okay, good. <clears throat> so what did he say about his first batch? Now we got the right ones. <clears throat> yeah, it's bothering me. I was like, why would the market not be tanking this? <laughs> what they said? Based on the minutes, here's a summary. Inflation has eased over the past year, remains elevated, signs of progress, but inflation is still above target. There's been uneven progress in reducing inflation across components. Energy and core goods have fallen or been stable, but core service inflation remains high. Participants expect further disinflation and supply demand imbalance continues. See, here's the problem. Since this time, we've got this Red Sea issue and inflation's creeping back in. And as I said, energy was driving the deflation and that's going to stop. Participants expect further disinflation uh, risks remain given still high inflation. Interest rates. All of them agreed to maintain the uh, current rate of 5.25%, judging recent data support policy stance for now. Most participants see the rates as likely or at or near peak, with cuts possible by the end of 2024, but that path remains data dependent. So all these people who are pricing in, like the Fed turning around shortly, are, are way off base, basically. Um, several noted circumstances could warrant keeping rates at the current level. Uh, so they, you know, there's a contingency in the Fed that thinks that that, that we should be longer than, than the end of 2024. The consensus is the end of 2024, not the beginning, the end. Uh, participants stress being patient in using rates to ensure inflation is clearly declining. So they stress being patient to ensure inflation is clearly declining. So any indication that inflation is not declining is going to tilt the Fed to at least much, much longer term, keeping it at this rate. And, and at worst, obviously, it could go back up to six. And six is where I always said it should be to, uh, to really kill inflation. They're not there yet. Recent data suggests economic growth is slow, Q3 job gains are moderating, but still solid and unemployment is low. Participants expect the growth to cool further in 2024. The labor market is rebalanced somewhat with unemployment rising modestly. Uncertainty remains high. Risk to inflation employment outlook was seen as more balanced compared to before. Overall, the minutes portray the Fed as seeing evidence of disinflationary progress, but are committed to staying the course with restricted policy until inflation is clearly on a sustained downward trajectory. I, I mean, guys, it's pretty freaking clear. And I trust Claude, he knows what he's talking about. It's pretty freaking clear that they are in no way, shape or form considering lowering rates in the first quarter, certainly not in the first quarter and probably not until after July. They wanna see how the summer goes. Uh, I was not able to provide a detailed comparison of the full minutes or long. Well, all right. The October minutes noted strong GD. So he does what he said. Uh, oh, well. I guess he was taking it like I wanted to do a line by line review. The October minutes noted strong GDP growth. While the December minutes data, the recent data suggests growth is slowed. Um, inflation, both still char characterize inflation as elevated, but December minutes specifically note inflation has eased over the past year. December minutes also note survey measures of near-term inflation expectations have declined recently. Policy rate. In October, the participants expected the policy to remain restricted for some time. In December, all, almost all of them submitted projections showing cuts likely appropriate by the end of 2024. So they went from, from an open-ended statement to end of 2024. That's what the big change was. In October, upside risks to inflation were emphasized. In December, risks were seen as more balanced. So in summary, the latest minutes post is an incremental softening in the economy and inflation has led participants to shade down policy rate projections, but risks are as still acknowledged and patience is preached. That's pretty freaking good. That's a, that is, I mean, that's a great analysis. I could not possibly have done a better analysis and it certainly would have taken me an hour. <laughs> so I'm very happy with that. All right. So meanwhile, what's the net effect of this? Uh, it's kind of all over the place, huh? Um, first it went down, now it's back up, and it's steady. They, there's nothing for the market to be excited about here, though. This is they're 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 basically saying there's no early rate hikes coming. They're pretty damn clear about that. Earnings, corporate earnings growth expected to drop markedly, and this really bothers me. We talked about this already because it's it's you know we're at record highs. When you're at record highs, you don't want to read things like this. 
Margins pressured by rate hikes are slowing demand. Earnings headwinds will intensify across regions. That's the consensus. See, then you can go to the main article. See, when you get to something like earnings, you might go back to the main article where we, you know, with all those quotes and read every analyst thing. So you get an idea of like what what really they're saying, the nuanced version. Um, returns, positive but muted returns across equities month. Base case supports single digit returns, lackluster returns. Defaults, recession risk would send default rates higher. We know that, that's obvious. Credit spreads not pricing severity expected. That That's what I, <laughs> that is what I say. You're just not pricing in the risks. Diversification, cash, gold, treasuries, or hedge. Um, alternative assets also cited as potential portfolio stabilizers. Uh, volatility markets are seen facing the higher volatility, geopolitics, uh, we know that, valuations, equity valuations appear stretched, opportunities in cheaper markets across the EM sectors, tech could face headwinds from AI disruption and valuations, that's an interesting way to look at it, cyclical value sectors seen as recovery plays, well, okay, yeah, let's talk about it, so, so tech, it's true. I mean, one of the reasons I was I, I was worried about Google this year was because Google is very AI is very disruptive to Google's business model. Google's business model is to show you a whole bunch of potential answers, and you read advertisement. That's their whole business model. They're like, yeah, well, we'll give you the information, but we won't actually give it to you. We're just gonna, you know, let you click on things, and the more you click, the more we make. Um, AI is like, oh, here's the answer. It's, unfortunately, it's not correct, but they go, here's the answer. And when you, you know, when you click on Google, they, they, they're actually better at it, but the way they're better at it is a very complex ranking system, so on and so forth. AI should probably figure out the same thing. They should be some combination. Meanwhile, ironically, BARD is absolutely the worst AI. It's so unreliable, it's not even usable. Um, and it's possible that Google doesn't want it to be better. They don't, they don't want you to be able to just get the answer. It, may, it makes no sense that Google has an AI that can't give you the right answer when Google itself is the best thing at giving you the right answer. Um, anyway, sectors, technology to face headwinds from AI disruption, cyclical value sectors or recovery plays. AIs, I, you know, to me, AI is, as I said earlier in the year, I was in one of, one of my interviews, I said this on uh, Money Talk. You know, AI is going to give you productivity gains the same way that the internet gave you productivity gains, but it took years. It does, it's not like next year it's going to happen, but overall, did the internet make us much more productive? Oh, absolutely. Over the course of the decade, we're going to be super productive. It's going to make huge differences in all sorts of things. Um, you know, and, and you have to think of it like a tool, not the the not the, the the solution or the thing that's going to just automatically run businesses it's a tool that makes you more productive that's what the internet is it's a tool that makes you more productive it's easier to access information it makes us more productive i mean the the just the time you spent listening to movie phone think about that right hello this is movie phone uh today uh, playing this and playing that right now it's like uh click fandango look at you know shows you what's playing at the theaters you like Here's the here's your four favorite three edits. Here's what's playing at your four favorite three edits. Here's all the times. Click here. You won't, now you got tickets. Goodbye. It's like that's what productivity is. People don't think about that. That is productivity. McDonald's productivity, right? You now walk into McDonald's and go press, press, press on your thing. Now, I don't know if they do this because I don't I don't have a McDonald's card or whatever, but. I don't even know if Starbucks does this, but they should, right? It should recognize you and have your favorite orders ready. It should, I mean, you know, to be put in. Like a Grubhub does that. If you go to Grubhub, when you pick a restaurant, it says, last time you uh, ordered this. And it shows you exactly what you ordered last time. You say, oh, yeah, I want that again. Even all your changes, even if you want preferences. And, you know, if it's like a Chinese place and you say, I want to get a sweet and sour, but more pineapple and some and some, it, it remembers everything you say. It's great. Highly recommend Grubhub. <laughs> um, AI is like that. It's, it's productivity doesn't mean 
making a task less this or less that. It's just a general ability to free up time for menial tasks. So, you know, there's there's many, many jobs where you do stuff and then you got paperwork, right? Um, you know, you, you get an order from a client and now you've got to write up the order and format it and go to processing and so on and so forth. So what if all that back end stuff was done by the AI and it just does all your desk work and you just sell and sell and sell and sell? You are more productive. Your company's more productive. You're you know, you're getting more money per salesperson, more time spent selling, less time spent doing office work. You know, that's productivity. And like I said, in McDonald's, it's productivity because now there's not, instead of having a line of 10 people waiting for the order girl to, to mess up your order, now you pick on the machine and go bip, 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 and you're done and you hit enter and they've got six terminals. They used to have one person taking orders. They, McDonald's decided to have six, I got to think $20,000 terminals, you know, stand up things with the big screens. They got like six of them for people, and they're and I think they're two sided. If I if I remember correctly, they're two sided. So they're you know somebody on each side. So twelve people at a time can be ordering at McDonald's, and it all flies into the kitchen, and the kitchen is super automated. Also, um, that's productivity, and there's going to be a lot of that. It's easier to implement with AI. McDonald's spends you know hundreds of millions of dollars with programmers making the best possible processes and so on and so forth but now it, it almost any company is able to take advantage and figure out certain things that can be done with ai to save them a lot of time and effort like very very easy to set up form templates and have things done automatically and so in other words real estate right you if you're a real estate agent you tell ai here's what a uh, here's what a standard contract is for a single family home, blah, blah, blah. Here's how you write it up, blah, blah, blah. So then, then you just sit there and say to the AI, oh, hey, I need a single family home mortgage uh, contract written up for this guy. And here's the, here's the buyer, here's the seller, here's the information, put all that in and give me the form. And it's like, boom, done. You know, could you do that with a database and output? Sure. But the point is anybody can do this now. It's not that easy yet, but it's going to get easier and easier where it'll be a simple conversation you have with your AI to get everything done the way you want it. And that's going to lead to huge productivity gains, but not yet. We're now in the figuring it out and, 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 and spending money to implement things phase. So it's not going to have an immediate, immediate benefit. And like I said, there's only about 11 different stocks like Microsoft and NVIDIA and uh, you know that 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 and and Amazon because of the cloud, uh, there are only about 11 stocks that actually sell AI. IBM, that that you know, so that they've got the AI. And think about like the companies who've sold the internet services. They've got the they're the ones that are that are booming and making real money. The other companies are spending money to buy the AI and buy the cloud services and buy this and that. They're 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 spending money on R&D using the cloud, it's a tool. That's what you gotta think of AI as a tool, the same way the internet's a tool. When we first got the internet, we got it, and then we tried to figure out how to use it to, to uh, be more efficient, make more money. We did figure it out. Everybody figured it out. At, literally everybody figured it out eventually. There's almost nobody, you know, there's almost no businesses at all that don't use the internet anymore. So yeah, we all figured it out over time and changed our business models and we are more efficient. And that's what led to the huge boom in the 80s and 90s. So, so you know, long term, I'm pretty bullish. We'll get there. This is going, this is a, a major thing, but AI is still under threat because the, first of all, people are scared of it. Second of all, um, the way they the way they took their data took they didn't get their data they took their data and they took it by scraping the web and pulling up information and so on and so forth and had they just used wikipedia and other public sources of information they would have been fine but they didn't they used the new york times and things like that and the new york times is suing right now and saying that's our data you built your entire program using our hundred years worth of data that we put out there and we and we want to be paid basically. And IBM and, and the New York Times does not want to sue AI and stop them from doing it. They want to get paid. But if they get paid, 
everyone's going to want to get paid. Everybody who they took any information from, any books that were under contract with a publisher and so on and so forth, all the things it read, all the articles from Newsweek and whatever, uh, every newspaper, every this and that, that, that's a big disaster. And what's that going to do? That's going to either end up sending AI down the private path where it'll be very expensive and people have to pay a lot of money to access AI, like LexisNexis or something like that, like the way that works. Or, and by the way, LexisNexis also scrapes all this information and provides data and um, it's the same logic. So that, so so whatever they're, the way they work is the way it would have to work. But meanwhile, the, the gist of it is it'll be more expensive. AI will not be a cheap service anymore. It may become like $100 a month. It'll be like the internet. It'll be like $100 a month <clears throat> for your AI. And then it's going to matter a lot who's got the best AI. So again, though, I would lean towards Microsoft who can afford to make these settlements uh, versus a lot of these other providers like Anthropic who has Claude. They don't have, they, they don't have the money. And I'm not sure they, you know, they're being backed by a couple of uh, large companies, but um, my, you know, Microsoft has already put 10 billion into uh, OpenAI, and they'll put they'll be happy to put in more. <laughs> they'll be happy to take, put in more and take control of it is what they want. So AI, honestly, I know I know a lot of you guys are probably sick of hearing about AI, and uh, even when I'm reading the news and put and going through my news articles every day, I, I mean AI is half of the stuff. Um, but I mean, I, I had the same thing when it was the internet, when it was the internet, people were like, oh, you talk about the internet all the time. It's like, well, of course I'm going to talk about the internet all the time. It's, it's a game changing thing. It's the, it's the thing that's going to drive the next 10 years of progress. So, you know, don't avoid it. You got to dive into it and you've really got to learn it. Um, <laughs> And, and and on that, I would point to like my mom who has an iPhone and an iPad and an iWatch, and she uses all that stuff. And and if you would have told me when when my, when when the iPhone first came out, <laughs> I mean it was like such a joke trying to get my parents to try to learn how to use it. And here we are, you know, it's 20 years later, but damn, if she didn't learn all those things. Um, eventually. If something works and it really does improve your life and, and gives you what you want uh, as, entertain, as entertainment or as useful communications or information or whatever, it's going to be adapted by almost everybody. It's not, it's not a fluke. You can't treat it like that. Eventually, you'll have to learn to use it. So you can take 20 years like my mom or you can take uh, a month and a half like my kids who were screaming with, for i when when the ipods were out they had to have ipods but once the ipods came out with messaging there was no way you could deny your kid one because they, if you did it you'd be uh you socially ostracizing up in the northeast anyway i mean everybody in the school and i'm told my daughter was 10 so this is 2012 so in 2012 which is around when i guess the iphone came out um the first the ipods were given texting ability and and that uh, she might have been younger than that. I don't remember how young she. Yeah, I remember she was so young. I was just. Uh, I, I just. We were thinking it was ridiculous, but it, it was a social aspect. I realized like all of her friends were texting each other on these iPods, and um, and uh, it was you know how can you tell that she can't have one? That's how they communicate. It's like it's like telling a little girl she can have a phone back in my day. You know, it's like you know that's how they talk. You know, you can't be the person without a phone. It's like, like it's like ostracizing it from her school. Anyway, so then then the iPhone came out, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to buy my child a phone, but they had to have it. That's how they all adapted. But Im immediately when it came out, as soon as people started getting it, everybody's had to have it, and you just couldn't be left out. AI is like that, and and don't think that it's a fad. It's not a fad. Um. Magnificent Seven, I've talked a lot about. That's uh, going to be a thing for a while. Real estate, commercial real estate, disaster. 30% of the commercial properties in most big cities are unoccupied. <clears throat> that's that's going to collapse. And that doesn't collapse immediately because companies sign five commercial leases are usually like five years. So from COVID, 2000, uh, damn it. 
when was it? 2020, right? So it was 2020, COVID started. And um, and it's, it's only just now, five years later. It's not even five years later. So, but, but people had leases before then, but the point is it hasn't been long enough where the leases are all coming up and some leases are 10 years. So a lot of these properties, you know, there's companies everywhere paying for office space they're not using. And when they go to roll over their leases, they're gonna say to the landlord, like, hey, I, I, I'll need either give me, either I'm giving up the space or you're gonna lower the price or something. And that's when these losses are gonna get realized and it's gonna get very, very ugly. You know, it's interesting because if you're a landlord and your rents don't cover your building, right? So let's say I, let's say I spend uh, 10 million bucks for a building and my my uh, I'm covered taxes and rents and the maintenance people I need and whatever, fine. So I'm basically breaking uh, even, which is usually how you buy a building. You buy a building, you expect to basically break even at first. And sometimes you might even accept a bit of a loss at first, but your attitude is I'm going to raise rents over time. And uh, I'm paying, all I'm doing is really having all my tenants pay off the equity in the building. So 15 years from now, I own the building free and clear. I've made 10 million bucks. You put down 2 million for a deposit. You're paying off an $8 million mortgage. And in 15 years, you have a $10 million building, hopefully it appreciated to 12 million or 15 million. That's, that's how real estate works. But you're not making money generally until the very later years, you don't make money on the building. So if you have this, $2 million deposit, you've got $8 million in rents coming in, paying off your uh, enough rents to pay off your mortgage, which would be roughly a million a year would be coming in to pay off your mortgage for, for your rents on your on your building. Um, now, what happens if you're only getting $700,000 a year? You need $300,000 now out of your pocket to pay it. So that forces, so in other words, that's what happens. So as these leases roll over, the landlord has less and less money, but at first it's one guy, then it's another guy, then it's a few more guys, and you have less and less money to pay your mortgage, it means every month you need more and more money to pay out of pocket to hold the building, and eventually that doesn't work, and um, economically, it's a commercial property, so you walk away, you go, what? You, Flip your hands and go up. So sorry, bank. I'm take, I'm out of here. And depending on the contracts, you know, I mean, some landlords take it or whatever. But that's the cycle. And then the bank will hold it for a while, but then they're going to eventually liquidate it. Now they've got your two million dollars already, and if so, they only have to sell the building for eight million dollars. But maybe they they might even take a haircut and get seven. Um, but that's how things finally start coming down because the new landlord is buying the same building for $7 million. He puts down $1.5 million. He's got a much lower uh, need for rents and he can now rent the same building for less money. The current landlord can't do that. He's stuck in his paradigm with the bank. This is why commercial real estate is such a mess because that's what happens. This guy's stuck in his building with his mortgage and his payments and his, and his expenses. He can't change that. And so he has no choice but to actually just flip the building, and take a loss and whatever. The bank will then give it to somebody else. Now, if the bank would just go to the guy and say, hey, we're going to redo your mortgage as if it's uh, $7 million instead of this, and we'll change the terms or something, they could save these buildings, but they don't do that. The banks just want to get out and get their money and be done. And they'll make the money on the next set of buildings because the next guy who has a $7 million building, which was the same $10 million building, that guy's gonna make money and he'll make his 20%, hopefully, if, they, if things improve. If they don't, then the bank will take another loss and then the next guy will be the guy who they finally win with and make money. But the banks don't The banks don't wanna do you any favors. Banks like, you take the loss, you get the frick out of here, I'll talk to the next guy. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll, we'll work with him. And that's, it's, it's a crazy system, but that's how it works. But that's how all deflation works. The same thing goes with factories that go into foreclosure uh, or manufacturers or warehouses or retail stores, right? You know, you buy up um, like uh, um, uh, big lots bought, um, Best Buy, bought, bought Bed Bath & Beyond. No, not big lots, it's Overstock. Overstock bought Bed Bath & Beyond and 
they bought all their stuff at fire sale prices. That was great for them. They loaded up a ton of inventory. They took on the assets of the company, but they didn't take on the debts. And now they've got all this stuff at lower prices. This is how you get um, deflation. But deflation comes from economic pain suffered by the people who invested at the high points of the market. But you have to go through that pain. And that's why when you talk about a soft landing, the Fed wants to inflict that pain because they've got to force those buildings to get turned over. They've got to force those businesses to liquidate the ones that are not going to be profitable at this, at this kind of rate environment. They want that to happen because that's the only way you're going to get lower rates. If you, if you save the guy who's got the $10 million building and, and he's going to just keep charging $10 million rents, when, the, when for other businesses to thrive, for his tenants to thrive, they need $7 million rents, not $10 million rents. <clears throat> so commercial real estate still unwinding. It's still, it's a very slow process and you think it's better, but it's not better, it's just slow. Um, yields, of course, spreads are interesting. Um, defaults are obviously a big problem right now. Tightening, uh, it, you know, Policy lads to fully transmit the delayed impacts of tightening have to have further to run. It's going to take a while. Um, refinancing. Um, oh, yeah, that's a, and again, things are in cycle. So it takes a while for the rates to hit. We had a rapid, rapid rate hike, and it's really going to hit people in not now, but in a year from now, it's going to start really hitting people on their balance sheets, how much more they have to spend in interest. It's much more expensive. The debt that comes up is much more expensive to refinance down the road. That's why you got to be very careful about real estate sectors and all that. I used to love SKT. Um, what is this? Huh. Gallery view. Let's see how they're holding up. SKT is now door mall. And you got to look at their debt service, but now yeah, they hold. They're doing. They're doing super good. They're, they're holding up very nicely. But you've got to look very carefully at them. You got to go to their earnings presentation. But you got to look carefully, at like when their debt rollovers come, and that's going to tell you whether or not it's a good time to get in here and do this. Energy, you know. Oil, and I wrote a whole article about this recently. I mean, oil's dead. Oil is oil on the way out. So, you know, we will always use oil for things, but, you know, the majority of oil is used for fuel, fuel and plastic. That's what oil is used for. We're getting rid of plastic. We're getting rid of fuel. Um, it's going to happen. So there will be a glut of oil eventually that is never going to really be used. And oil will go back to like $20 at some point, but that, I'm talking about at some point, like 10, 15 years, it'll be back to like 20 bucks and it'll never, it'll, that'll be the end of it. It'll be just a material that people use for things. Um, there's a transitional period, but sometime between now and 15 years, oil will go from, from 70 to 20. And so the long-term general bet on oil is it will get cheaper, except for, you know, intermediate disruptions like we're having now. But generally, they're going to get cheaper. Metals, gold is my very, I'm very big on gold. And the stock GOLD is a, a very big one that we like. Uh, private markets, we don't care about. Hedge funds, uh, you know, good, it's good. good to, if, you know, if you're not a good stock picker, hedge funds are good for you. Um, I'm not worried about that. The base case supports uh, risk asset gains. But, you know, a, a any rally rests on a benign landing for the economy. That's a good statement. So that's where we are. Um, so where's briefing.com? Oh, my voice is going good. Very nice. Good voice. Beta character. Hang on. I don't care about you. B-R-I-E-F-I-N. Briefing.com. There you are. Calendars. Oh, no, we're not really getting that, I see. Um, nope. So now we're going to talk to Bing. Hello, Bing. 
new topic uh auto companies reported sales today can you give me a rundown of the reports So auto sales up 11% this year. Wow, Hyundai came, Hyundai came up a lot. Uh, automotive industry has a slow start first half of 22, blah, blah, blah. Why are you telling me about 2022 M&A activity decrease in signal? Okay. Let's just, let's take a look at this report. Oh, this is summer of 2023. This is not good. All right, so we're not we don't have the current information from Mr. Bing, even though he acts like he has it. So anyway, I was looking at this, I was thinking about like what information we have today <clears throat> on the calendar. And while all the reports are coming out, they're not good. We looked at the ISM, that's lower, mortgage is lower. You know, these are recessionary looking things. The job openings when are more, there's more job, oh no, not more, less. A little bit, teeny bit less job openings than before. So not much of a change, that's not, a, that's not important. And now we have the Fed, the Fed minutes, which is interesting that they don't actually show them what's going on. For the rest of the week, that's not that important. PMI is important. And we're just, just over, this is service PMI. Service PMI is just over neutral. That's not necessarily good. Um, and then tomorrow's non-farm payrolls. Non-farm payrolls really, they, they, they're forecasting way less jobs, though. I don't know if that's going to, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's, just, I don't know where they're getting this number from. Um, I guess, I guess people let go. It depends on where they count the, the, the people who release their Christmas help. I'm not sure when that happens or how that impacts things. Um, average hourly earnings is going to be important. They think it's, you know, see, you know, it's, the, these expectations, they're looking for a, a drop to 0.2% for average hourly earnings. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, average work week is unchanged. Factory orders, they're looking for a big turnaround in factory orders. Um, and ISM, <clears throat> they're expecting it to be flat. So we'll see how that works. But anyway, so the short story is more, you know, it's what Claude's saying. It's basically we're, um, you know, th there's too much expectation of the Fed cutting rates. And I think that's a problem for equities moving forward. And as I said, there's nothing to get excited about here. And that's pretty much what we're seeing. All right. So holy cow, two hours. Very amazing. Uh, da, 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 da. Hey, Randy. Oh, see if I only heard, if I only could see, I can only see this thing if I open up the window. So thanks, Randy. <laughs> anyway, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fun uh, 2024. The markets are going to be interesting. There's lots of cool stuff to invest in. I'm excited about it. And uh, I think we're going to enjoy ourselves. So very happy new year to everybody. And I will see you all next week. All right. We will chat some more. Take care.